the Anguttara Nikaya, Book of the Threes, Suttas 21 to 30, Three Types of Persons. Thus have I heard. At one time, the Blessed One was staying at Anathapindika's park in Jeta's Grove in the city of Savati, where both the Venerable Savitta and the Venerable Mahakotita, in approaching the Venerable Sariputta, exchanged courteous greetings and sat down to one side. Once this was done, the Venerable Sariputta, addressing the Venerable Savitta, stated, Friend Savitta, there are these three types of beings found in existence. What three? Here, there is the body witness, the one attained to view, and the one liberated through faith. These are the three types of beings found in existence. And out of these three, which one do you consider to be the one who stands out as the most excellent? Friend Sariputta, out of those three types of beings, I consider the liberated through faith to be the one who stands out as the most excellent. And for what reason? It is because this person's faculty of faith is supreme. At this point, the Venerable Sariputta turned to Venerable Mahakotita and said, Friend Kotita, there are these three types of beings found in existence. What three? Here there is the body witness, the one attained to view, and the one liberated through faith. These are the three types of beings found in existence. And out of these three, which one do you consider to be the one who stands out as the most excellent? Friend Sariputta, out of those three types of beings, I consider the body witness to be the one who stands out as the most excellent. And for what reason? It is because this person's faculty of collectedness of mind is supreme. Then the Venerable Mahakotita, turning to the Venerable Sariputta, said, Friend Sariputta, there are these three types of beings found in existence. What three? Here there is the body witness, the one attained to view, and the one liberated through faith. These are the three types of beings found in existence. And out of these three, which one do you consider to be the one who stands out as the most excellent? Friend Kotita, out of those three types of beings, I consider the one attained to view to be the one who stands out as the most excellent. And for what reason? It is because this person's faculty of wisdom is supreme. At this, the Venerable Sariputta, turning to the Venerable Savitta and the Venerable Mahakotita, and said to them, Friends, we each have given our ideal choice and also explained the reason behind it. Let us go and approach the Blessed Lord and report this matter to Him. This way, as He explains it to us, so should we remember and apply it in our practice. Yes, friend, replied the Venerable Savitta and the Venerable Mahakotita. And together with Venerable Sariputta, all three of them approached the Blessed One. And after paying homage to Him, they sat down to one side. Afterwards, the Venerable Sariputta related the entire conversation held earlier between himself and the other two bhikkhus. Then the Blessed One said, Sariputta, it is not easy to make a clear distinction in regards to this matter by concluding that out of these three only this type of person is the most excellent. This is the case because a person who is liberated through faith can be practicing in a way that will surely lead him to arahantship, while another person who is a body witness and someone else who has attained to view are merely once-returners or non-returners. Therefore, Sariputta, 
it is not easy to make a clear distinction in regards to this matter by concluding that out of these three only this type of person is the most excellent. This is the case because a person who is a body witness can be practicing in a way that will surely lead him to arahantship while another person who is liberated through faith and someone else who has attained to view are merely once returners or non-returners. Therefore, Sariputta, it is not easy to make a clear distinction in regards to this matter by concluding that out of these three only this type of person is the most excellent. This is the case also because a person who has attained to view can be practicing in a way that will surely lead him to arahantship, while another person who is liberated through faith and someone else who is a body witness are merely once returners or non-returners. Therefore, Sariputta, it is not easy to make a clear distinction in regards to this matter by concluding that out of these three, only this type of person is the most excellent. Bhikkhus, there are these three types of ailing beings found in existence. What three? Here, an ailing person will not be able to recover from his illness, whether he does or does not get suitable nourishment suitable medicine, and a caring and competent caretaker. Another ailing person is one who recovers from his illness, whether he does or does not get suitable nourishment, suitable medicine, and a caring and competent caretaker. Finally, there is the ailing person who will recover from his illness only if he does get suitable nourishment, suitable medicine and a caring and competent caretaker, and not if he is deprived of them. Suitable nourishment, suitable medicine, and a caring and competent caretaker are intended especially for the ailing person who will recover from his illness only in the presence of suitable nourishment, suitable medicine, and a caring and competent caretaker, and not without them. However, Given the benefit these factors have on this type of a person, the other ailing persons similarly must also be provided with these benefits. These are the three types of ailing persons found in existence. Similarly, bhikkhus, there are these three types of beings, much like those ailing persons found in existence. What three? Here, Someone will not be dedicated to a wholesome way of life, whether he does or does not come in contact with the Tathagata, or whether he does or does not hear the Dhamma and discipline proclaimed by the Tathagata. Meanwhile, another being will be dedicated to a wholesome way of life, whether he does or does not come in contact with the Tathagata, or whether he does or does not hear the Dhamma and discipline proclaimed by the Tathagata. Finally, yet another being will be dedicated to a wholesome way of life, only because he comes in contact with the Tathagata, and only because he is able to hear the Dhamma and discipline proclaimed by the Tathagata. Thus, providing the teachings of the Dhamma, are intended especially for the being who will be dedicated to a wholesome way of life only because he comes in contact with the Tathagata and only because he is able to hear the Dhamma and discipline proclaimed by the Tathagata and not without the presence or teaching of the Tathagata. However, given the benefit these factors have on this type of being, the other beings similarly must also be taught the Dhamma and discipline. These are the three types of beings that are similar to the ailing persons found in existence. Bhikkhus, there are these three types of beings found in existence. What three? Here, Bhikkhus, a person engages in bodily acts that produce suffering, verbal acts that produce suffering, and mental acts that produce suffering. 
As a result, this person is reborn in a world full of suffering. Once reborn into such a world of suffering, he is constantly surrounded and rubbed by suffering. Being thus rubbed by suffering from all sides, he experiences torture, feeling agonizing pain, as do those who are reborn in hell. Here, another person engages in bodily acts that do not produce suffering, verbal acts that do not produce suffering, and mental acts that do not produce suffering. As a result, this person is reborn in a world devoid of suffering. Once reborn into such a world devoid of suffering, he is constantly surrounded and touched by pleasure. Being thus touched by pleasure from all sides, he experiences joy and relief, feeling the bliss of comfort, as do those who are reborn in heaven. Still another person engages in bodily acts that produce suffering and those that do not produce suffering. Verbal acts that produce both suffering and those that do not produce suffering. And mental acts that produce both suffering and those that do not produce suffering. As a result, this person is reborn into such a world that includes suffering and at times its absence. Once reborn into such a world that includes suffering and at times its absence, he is surrounded and touched by both pleasure and pain. Being thus rubbed by both suffering and touched by pleasure from time to time, he experiences agonizing pain and sometimes feeling relief or the bliss of comfort, as do human beings some devas and some others who are born into lower realms. These bhikkhus are the three types of beings found in existence. Bhikkhus, these three types of beings are found to be helpful to another. What three? The person who becomes the conduit for a person to take refuge in the Buddha the Dhamma and Sangha. Such a person is helpful to another. Further, another person who becomes the conduit for another person to understand as it actually is, this is suffering. This is the origin of suffering. This is the ending of suffering. And this is the path that leads to the ending of suffering. Such a person is helpful to another. Still another person who becomes the conduit for another person to realize for himself with his own direct knowledge, through the destruction of the contaminants, the spotless and unshakable serenity of mind, liberation by wisdom, whereby entering upon it he dwells in it. This indeed is truly a helpful person to another. These three types of beings are found to be helpful to another. Bhikkhus, I declare to you how there is no one more helpful to another than these three types of beings. Also, it is not easy to be able to repay these three beings by paying homage to them, by rising up for them, standing in reverential salutation to them, by one's proper conduct, by offering them robes, alms food, lodgings and medicine, and other medical supplies and necessities. Bhikkhus, there are these three types of beings found in existence. What three? Someone who has a mind that is similar to an open wound, another whose mind is like that of lightning, and yet another whose mind is like diamond. And who, Bhikkhus, is that person who has a mind that is similar to an open wound? Here, a person, being irritable, is prone to easily get enraged. Even if he were to receive a minor criticism, 
he becomes quickly infuriated, angry, and stubborn. In addition, much like an open wound, he stays inflamed and bitter, easily provoked at the slightest contact, much like a wound that would ooze out more stuff from it when touched. The same with his hatred and rage, with those around him having to walk on eggshells as if to avoid provocation. This is a person who has a mind that is similar to an open wound. And who, Bhikkhus, is that person whose mind is like that of lightning? Here, a person understands as it actually is. This is suffering. This is the origin of suffering. This is the ending of suffering. And this is the path that leads to the ending of suffering. Much like in the darkest part of the night, when a lightning strikes, and a man with good eyesight could see its flash, in such a way that a person understands as it actually is. This is suffering. This is the origin of suffering. This is the ending of suffering. And this is the path that leads to the ending of suffering. This is a person whose mind is like that of lightning. And who, because is that person whose mind is like diamond? Here, a person, through the destruction of the contaminants, realizes in this life for himself and with direct knowledge the unshakable serenity of mind, its liberation through wisdom, which he abides in, dwelling in it. Similar to the diamond that can cut anything, whether cutting a gem, a rock, or a metal, while itself stays intact, so too, by him cutting through and destroying the contaminants, such a person realizes in this life for himself and with direct knowledge the unshakable serenity of mind, its liberation through wisdom, which he abides in, dwelling in it. This is a person whose mind is like diamond. These bhikkhus, are the three types of beings found in existence. Because there are these three types of beings found in existence. What three? The one who is not to be engaged nor associated with, nor attended to. The one who is to be engaged and associated with, and attended to. And finally, the one to be engaged and associated with, and attended to with much honor and reverence. And who, because is the person that is not to be engaged and associated with, nor attended to? Here, someone is found to be one inferior to oneself in conduct, with an immoral character, lacking in virtue, mental cultivation, and wisdom. This person is one not to be engaged nor associated with, but only attended to as a result of one's loving kindness and compassion. And who, because is the person that is to be engaged and associated with and attended to? Here, someone is found to be of a similar or equal conduct to oneself and with a moral character supported by virtue, conduct, mental cultivation, and wisdom. This person is one to be engaged and associated with and attended to. And why is that? It is because one considers this person is of a similar conduct to mine and with a moral character, supported by virtuous conduct and as a result of this will have a beneficial effect on us both by making us feel congruently happy as we discuss virtue. Also, our mutual dedication to mental cultivation will have a beneficial effect on us both by making us feel congruently happy as we discuss mental cultivation. Also, our mutual appreciation and application of wisdom will have a beneficial effect on us both by making us feel congruently happy as we discuss wisdom. 
To this end, such a person is to be engaged and associated with, and attended to. And who, bhikkhus, is the person to be engaged and associated with, and attended to, with much honor and reverence? Here, someone is found to be of a superior conduct to oneself, and with a moral character, supported by virtue, mental cultivation, and wisdom. This person is one to be engaged and associated with, and attended to with much honor and reverence. And why is that? It is because one considers, through my interaction with this person, whatever aggregate associated with virtue that is unfulfilled in me will be fulfilled. Or through wisely interacting with this person, the aggregate of virtuous conduct will come to fruition in me. Further, through my interaction with this person, whatever aggregate associated with mental cultivation in me that is unfulfilled will become fulfilled. Or through wisely interacting with this person, the aggregate of mental cultivation will come to fruition in me. Further, through my interaction with this person, whatever aggregate associated with wisdom that is unfulfilled in me will become fulfilled, or through wisely interacting with this person, the aggregate of wisdom will come to fruition in me. To this end, such a person is to be engaged and associated with, and attended to, with much honor and reverence. These bhikkhus are the three types of beings found in existence. By associating with the inferior person, you regress. By associating with an equal person, you do not regress. By attending to a superior person, you advance quickly. So, follow the one superior to you and don't look back. Bhikkhus, there are three types of beings found existing in the world. What three? The one who is disgusting to look at, not worthy to be associated with, nor attended to, nor followed. The one who is looked upon with equanimity, yet not worthy to be associated with, attended to, or followed. And finally, the one who is associated with, attended to, and followed. And who, bhikkhus, is that person who is disgusting to look at? Not worthy to be associated with, nor attended to, nor followed. Here, someone is impure, non-virtuous, immoral, with suspect behavior, not a true recluse, although pretending to be one, secretive in his actions, dishonest, unscrupulous, depraved and inwardly perverted, engaging in non-celibate acts, although claiming to be celibate. It is such a person who is disgusting to look at, not worthy to be associated with, nor attended to, nor followed. And what would be the reason for this? It is because even if one were to not follow the example of such a person, there would still be a bad report spreading about oneself due to association that states, So-and-so has such bad companions and associates, who must also be like him. Otherwise, why would they be around him? It is just like a snake that slithers its way through a pile of feces. Even if it were not to bite anyone, it would still pass on the smell and residue of the feces unto whatever and whomever it touches. Similarly, even if one were to not follow the example of such a person, there would still be a bad report spreading about oneself due to association, that states, So-and-so has companions and associates, who must also be like him. Otherwise, why would they be around him? It is for this reason that such a person is disgusting to look at, 
not worthy to be associated with, nor attended to, nor followed. And who, Bhikkhus, is that person who is looked upon with equanimity, yet not worthy to be associated with, attended to, or followed? Here, someone is irritable and is prone to easily get enraged, even if he were to receive a minor criticism. He becomes quickly infuriated, angry, and stubborn. In addition, much like an open wound, he stays inflamed and bitter, easily provoked at the slightest contact, whereby more stuff would ooze out from it when touched. Similarly with such a person, who is irritable and prone to easily getting enraged, even if he were to receive a minor criticism, he becomes quickly infuriated, angry, and stubborn. It is just like the incendiary timber of the tinduka tree. Even if barely touched, it begins to crackle. So too such a person is irritable and prone to easily getting enraged, even if he were to receive a minor criticism, whereby he becomes quickly infuriated, angry, and stubborn. It is just like a pile of feces, if struck or accidentally stepped into, releases its foul smell, so too much like an open wound. Such an irritable person stays inflamed and bitter, easily provoked at the slightest contact, whereby more stuff would ooze out from it when touched. It is such a person that needs to be looked upon with equanimity, yet not worthy to be associated with, attended to, nor followed. And what would be the reason for this? It is because one will consider, such a bitter person might insult and abuse me, or do harm to me. It is for this reason that such a person is to be looked upon with equanimity, yet not worthy to be associated with, attended to, nor followed. And who, bhikkhus, is that person who is associated with, attended to, and followed? Here, someone is found to be of a virtuous and pure conduct. It is such a person that is to be associated with, attended to, and followed. And what would be the reason for this? It is because even if one were to not follow the example of such a person, there would still be a good report spreading about oneself, due to association, that states, so-and-so has such good companions and associates, who must also be like him. Otherwise, why would they be around him? It is for this reason that such a person is to be associated with, attended to, and followed. These, bhikkhus, are the three types of beings found in existence. By associating with the inferior person, you regress. By associating with an equal person, you do not regress. By attending to a superior person, you advance quickly. So, follow the one superior to you and don't look back. Bhikkhus, these are the three types of beings found in existence. What three? The one whose speech is like that of animal dung, the other whose speech resembles flowers, and lastly the one whose speech is like honey. And who, Bhikkhus, is that person whose speech is like animal dung? Here, someone is asked to show up at an assembly or to his relatives' gathering, or to a gathering of his colleagues, or to stand in council, or to appear at the royal court, and be asked to report on a matter as a witness, thus. Tell us, sir, what you have witnessed. At which he states that he has witnessed what he in fact has not, or when having witnessed something he denies having witnessed it, Thus, when not having seen, he says, I have seen, and when having seen, he says, I haven't seen. Such a person lies knowingly, 
and speaks falsehood to secure his own ends, or those of others, or some trivial worldly goal that he has in mind. Such is a person whose speech is like that of animal dung. And who, Bhikkhus, is that person whose speech resembles flowers? Here, when someone is asked to show up at an assembly, or to his relative's gathering, or to a gathering of his colleagues, or to stand in council, or to appear at the royal court, and be asked to report on a matter as a witness, thus, Tell us, sir, what you have witnessed at which he states that he has witnessed what he in fact has witnessed, or when having not witnessed, he denies having witnessed it. Thus, when not having seen, he says, I have not seen, and when having seen, he says, I have seen. Such a person does not lie knowingly, and speaks the truth not to secure his own ends, nor those of others, nor some trivial worldly goal that he has in mind. Such is a person whose speech is like that of flowers. And who, Bhikkhus, is that person whose speech is like honey? Here, someone has relinquished the use of abusive and mean speech, and he consciously refrains from the use of abusive and mean speech. His speech is kindly, encouraging and lovely to the ear, and goes straight to the heart, respectful and considerate, thereby welcome and enjoyable by many. Such is the person whose speech is like that of honey. Bhikkhus, these are the three types of beings found in existence. Bhikkhus, there are these three types of beings found in existence. What three? The blind, the one with a single eye, and the one with two eyes. And who, Bhikkhus, is the blind individual? Here, someone does not possess the eye through which one may obtain riches that have otherwise been unobtained, and cannot increase his wealth that has already been accumulated. Such an individual does not also possess the eye with which to see and distinguish the unwholesome qualities from those that are wholesome, the blameworthy qualities from those that are blameless, the inferior qualities from those that are superior, as well as the differences between dark and bright traits, in regards to one's actions and choices. Such is the blind and who, Bhikkhus, is the one with a single eye? Here, someone possesses the eye through which one may obtain riches that have otherwise been unobtained, and increases his wealth that has already been accumulated. Such an individual, however, does not possess the eye with which to see and distinguish the unwholesome qualities from those that are wholesome, the blameworthy qualities from those that are blameless the inferior qualities from those that are superior, as well as telling apart the differences between dark and bright traits in regards to one's actions and choices. Such is the one with a single eye. And who, Bhikkhus, is the one with two eyes? Here, someone possesses the eye through which one may obtain riches that have otherwise been unobtained and increases his wealth that has already been accumulated. Such an individual also possesses the eye with which to see and distinguish the unwholesome qualities from those that are wholesome, the blameworthy qualities from those that are blameless, the inferior qualities from those that are superior, as well as telling apart the differences between dark and bright traits in regards to one's actions and choices. Such is the one with two eyes. Bhikkhus, these are the three types of beings found in existence. Not possessing material wealth, similarly empty in his store of good merits, he finds himself unlucky in both throws of the dice, the man with no eyes. 
Cheating and stealing, the one who lies, adds more wealth, indulging in sense pleasures. As he rushes his way from here to hell, this one with a single eye. The best, though, is the one with eyes that number in two, with riches acquired through his own efforts, and righteously earned wealth he opens up his stores of riches, sharing what he has with an undivided mind. Thus, when it is time, he leaves human birth to be reborn in heavenly realms, a stranger to sorrow. The best remains the one who, avoiding the blind and the single-eyed, calls the two-eyed a friend. Because there are these three types of beings found in existence. What three? The one with blocked wisdom, the one with scattered wisdom, and the one with vast wisdom. And who, because is the one with blocked wisdom? Here, someone often goes to the monastery to listen to the Dhamma from other bhikkhus. The bhikkhus generously teach him the Dhamma that is beautiful in the beginning, beautiful in the middle, and beautiful in the end, along with its correct meaning and phrasing. Having thus revealed to him the pure spiritual path that is perfect and complete, however, this person, while sitting there, does not pay attention to the Dhamma being taught, whether in its beginning, its middle, or its end. Also, after having left his seat and moving about, he still does not pay attention to what was shared with him, as he does not contemplate as to the beginning, the middle, or the end of the Dhamma taught to him earlier. It is just as if a water pot has been inverted, and the water poured down on it would simply flow over it and run off, leaving the water pot's cavity empty, dry, and untouched. Similarly, such a person often goes to the monastery to listen to the Dhamma from other bhikkhus. The bhikkhus generously teach him the Dhamma that is beautiful in the beginning, beautiful in the middle, and beautiful in the end, along with its correct meaning and phrasing. Having thus revealed to him the pure spiritual path that is perfect and complete, this person, while sitting there, does not pay attention to the Dhamma being taught, whether in its beginning, its middle, or its end. Also, after having left his seat and moving about, he still does not pay attention to what was shared with him, as he does not contemplate to the beginning, the middle, or the end of the Dhamma taught to him earlier. Such is the one with blocked wisdom. And who, bhikkhus, is the one with scattered wisdom? Here, someone often goes to the monastery to listen to the Dhamma from other bhikkhus. The bhikkhus generously teach him the Dhamma that is beautiful in the beginning, beautiful in the middle, and beautiful in the end, along with its correct meaning and phrasing. Having thus revealed to him the pure spiritual path that is perfect and complete, while at his seat, he attends carefully as he pays attention to the Dhamma being taught, whether in its beginning, its middle, or its end. However, after having left his seat and moving about, he does not pay attention to what was shared with him, as he does not contemplate to the meaning, the middle, or the end of the Dhamma taught to him earlier. It is just as if a person with a variety of food grains tossed into his lap, such as rice grains, sesame seeds, and jujubes, whereby if he moves suddenly and without care, he would scatter those precious grains all about him. Similarly, such a person often goes to the monastery to listen to the Dhamma from other bhikkhus. The bhikkhus generously teach him the Dhamma that is beautiful in the beginning, beautiful in the middle, and beautiful in the end, 
along with its correct meaning and phrasing. Having thus revealed to him the pure spiritual path that is perfect and complete, he attends to carefully as he pays attention to the Dhamma being taught, whether in its beginning, its middle, or its end. However, after having left his seat and moving about, he does not pay attention to what was shared with him, as he does not contemplate the beginning, the middle, or the end of the Dhamma taught to him earlier. Such is the one with scattered wisdom. And who, bhikkhus, is the one with vast wisdom? Here, someone often goes to the monastery to listen to the Dhamma from other bhikkhus. The bhikkhus generously teach him the Dhamma that is beautiful in the beginning, beautiful in the middle, and beautiful in the end, along with its correct meaning and phrasing. Having thus revealed to him the pure spiritual path that is perfect and complete, while at his seat, he attends carefully as he pays attention to the Dhamma being taught, whether its beginning, its middle, or its end. After having left his seat and moving about, he again pays attention to what was shared with him, as he contemplates the beginning, the middle, or the end of the Dhamma taught to him earlier. It is just as if a water pot has been placed upright, the water being poured down into it, filling it up, drenching the water pot without running off. Similarly, such a person often goes to the monastery to listen to the Dhamma from other bhikkhus. The bhikkhus generously teach him the Dhamma that is beautiful in the beginning, beautiful in the middle, and beautiful in the end, along with its correct meaning and phrasing. Having thus revealed to him the spiritual pure path that is perfect and complete. While at his seat, he attends carefully, as he pays close attention to the Dhamma being taught, whether in its beginning, its middle, or its end. And after having left his seat and moving about, he again pays attention to what was shared with him, as he contemplates to the beginning, the middle, or the end of the Dhamma taught to him earlier. Such is the one with vast wisdom. Bhikkhus, these are the three types of beings found in existence. The one with blocked wisdom, stupid and undiscerning, is found often visiting bhikkhus, hearing them teach the Dhamma. But from such a talk, this person misses out in grasping the meaning from its beginning, middle, and end. Being better than the former, the one with scattered wisdom also goes visiting bhikkhus hearing them teach the Dhamma. While sitting during such a talk, he grasps the meaning from its beginning, middle and end. But after leaving his seat, the wisdom grasped leaves him as well, forgetting what was learned. Being the best of the three, the one with vast wisdom also goes visiting bhikkhus, hearing them teach the Dhamma. While sitting during such a talk, he grasps the meaning from its beginning, middle, and end. In leaving his seat, his mind remains undivided, retaining what was heard as he practices what was learned, in accordance with the Dhamma, putting an end to suffering. Sad.